thank you so much for setting aside this time to go into the presence of God with us. We truly appreciate your presence. We do not take it lightly. Thank you for making time this blessed Sunday morning to spend with us. Amen. As we gather here to worship Jesus. Amen. So now, without further ado, please gather your Bibles. It is time for us to go into the word of God. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible in the Old Testament, the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. And we will be looking at chapter three, Exodus chapter three, and we will begin at verse one and we will stop at verse two for now. Then we'll see what God has to say for us. Verses one and two, Exodus chapter three, verses one and two. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. The text, verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So far, the scriptures. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for being the eternal God, the great I am, the sovereign God, the God who has entered into covenant relationship with us through your son. Because of the blood of Jesus, Lord God, we have access now into your presence that we can come boldly, Lord God, this morning, giving you thanks for who you are for being our daddy, for being our God, our redeemer, our savior, the one who came to rescue us. We thank you, Father God, for the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out, Lord God, to cover our sins, to pay for the price of our sins, Father God, to redeem us back to you. We thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of being your sons and daughters, Lord God, that we are your children. And we thank you today, Lord God, for your people who are gathered here. I ask, Lord God, for your presence to move among us in a great way. Manifest your power, Lord God. Manifest your glory. Let us see your goodness in this hour that we have together. Father, we thank you that you are the God of the impossible. There is nothing too hard for you, Lord God. We thank you that according to your word, Father God, in the book of Ephesians 3.20, Lord God, you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the all-powerful God being present with us now. Have your way, we pray, Lord God. I ask that you anoint me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, Father. I ask that you open my mouth and fill it with your words, that you speak to the hearts of your people today, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that we live according to every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Speak, Holy Spirit. We are listening. Have your way, we pray, in Jesus' name. And we thank you for these blessings, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we're looking now into the book of Exodus, into the life of, of a particular man, a man of God. At this point, he does not know that he is a man of God. All right, if you look back with me into chapter two, beginning at verse 11, the Bible says, Exodus chapter two, verse 11, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now we know here from this verse that God is showing us that Moses, and he had shown it to us from earlier in that chapter, that Moses is a Hebrew. And now Moses, after 40 years, at this point, Moses is about 40 years old. And the Bible says that he went out onto his brethren. He went out to, to look 
on his brothers, the Hebrew children. The Bible says he looked on their burdens. Now, when you look and you see people being being under pressure, when you see someone being oppressed, when you see someone going through difficulties, it does something to you. If you have a heart of compassion, it will touch you in a specific way. The Bible says in this verse that he spied, he saw an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now, what are you going to do if you see someone who hits one of yours, someone you consider a brother? Of course, you're going to intervene. Right? Any of us would intervene. The interesting thing here, though, is that Moses, up to this point, from three months after his birth until the current time, which is about 40 years old, Moses has been, had been raised as an Egyptian. So anyone would think that his affinity would be for the Egyptian. However, God had begun to do a work in Moses' heart to prepare him for something future that he was going to have him to do. And the Bible says in verse 12 that he looked this way. And that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So evidently, the smiting that the Egyptian was doing to the Hebrew was so concerning to Moses that Moses perceived that the only way that he could deal with this situation was to kill this Egyptian. Because to just hit, to just hit him, or maybe punch him or whatever, fight him in any way, pull his sword on him, the man would have lived to report Moses and whatever the, whatever the outcome of that would have fallen upon Moses. However, Moses thought, Moses thought to deal with the situation in an extreme way. And the, and the Bible says that he hid him in the sand. How many of us have done things and then we try to hide it, right? But people always find out, right? But most of all, God sees. The Bible says he hid him in the sand. Let's go on to verse 13. And he went out the second day and when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? So now the second time that he went out, he's seeing two of his brothers fighting. And so he said to the one who was in the wrong, why are you smiting your brother? Why are you fighting against each other? And isn't that what we, one of the things we don't like to see? We do not like to see families fighting. We do not like to see Christians fighting each other, right? It, it just does something to us that we say this should not be. Because Psalm 133 tells us that brothers should dwell together in unity. God said it is good. It is pleasant, right? It's a wonderful thing when there's unity in the brotherhood. Right? But now Moses is looking, his second time going out among his people, and he's seeing two, two, two um, Israelites fighting, two Hebrews fighting. The one who was in the wrong, Moses is asking him, why are you hitting him? Why are you fighting your brother? Verse 14, and he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Now this question, Moses is intervening in, in this situation, was not received well. Instead of being... Instead of being glad that the fight was broken apart, the one in the wrong confronted Moses and asked him, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Now Moses realized in that moment that what he had done before in killing and smiting the Egyptian and burying him in the sand, that it was no longer something that was hidden, that it was known, right? And it's a difficult thing when we do wrong and it is broadcasted, when we think we, our sin is hidden, it's okay. We can hold our heads out and up in, pro, in public, right? We feel like we can go around. Nobody knows what's going on with me. Nobody knows my struggles. Nobody knows my sorrows. Nobody knows the things that I am going through that are causing me to feel downcast. But when that is put out there, we can feel exposed. We can feel, we can feel that we are put at risk. Right. And this is evidently what Moses was feeling here, because the Bible says, and Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. So now fear is in his heart before he was bold and courageous. He was bold enough to kill to smite and kill and bury the Egyptian. And now he was bold enough to go and, and intervene in a fight between two Hebrew brothers, two Hebrew fellows. But now he realized that his sin was discovered and Moses began to fear. The Bible says, he said to himself, surely this thing is known. Verse 15. Now, when Pharaoh heard this thing, so now it's, it has come to the attention of the king of Egypt. The king of Egypt is called the Pharaoh. He sought to slay Moses, right? A life for a life. If you kill someone, you're, that should put, you should be put to death for that. 
The Bible says, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. So now Moses flew, flew away from, went away from Egypt. Now he fled from the place where his great sin was covered, uncovered, where his great sin was exposed, where the sin of murder, taking a life was exposed. Now everyone, it had gotten all the way to the attention of the Pharaoh now. So, so, so now Moses was running for his life. The Bible says he fled from the face of Pharaoh, where Pharaoh was going to bring judgment upon him for his sin, for his wrong, for his evil, for taking the life of an Egyptian. The Bible says, and Moses dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Verse 16, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to, to water their father's flock. So now this, this priest of Midian, who had seven daughters, and they were his daughters took care of his sheep, and their responsibility was to come and draw water from the well and to fill the trough with water so that the sheep could drink. And this was the very well that Moses was sitting at. The Bible goes on to tell us in verse 17 that shepherds came and drove these girls away, drove the priest of Midian's daughters away. But Moses stood up and helped them. So here we have Moses once again stepping into a situation to bring about to bring about what he thought was going to be the right thing to intervene in the situation and to right a wrong that was being done. So Moses is showing here a character of always getting involved in situations to fix what is wrong. According to his estimation, he was not one to sit back and watch things happen around him and not get involved. Many of us sit on the fence, straddle the fence and do not open our mouths. We do not speak out. When we see things going on wrong around us, we see people being taken advantage of and we do not speak up. But Moses was not of that nature. It was Moses' custom, as we saw back in Egypt and again here at Mid and Midian, that he was one to get involved. He was one to put himself in there. He was not afraid. He was not afraid to put himself there and get involved in a fight, even a physical fight, to protect those who were being hurt. So we have here seven girls being driven away by, by the shepherds and Moses stood up, right? It is time for some of you to stand up. It is time for some of you sitting here, listening to me here on Zoom. It is, is your time for you to stand up and to help, for you to get involved in situations that you have been ignoring around you, for things that you have been sitting silently and watching happen around you. This is now the time for you to get up and to move and to do something, to get involved. Amen. The Bible says he stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Now that moment, that decision, that that instant that Moses stepped in and helped before in Egypt, when he did it, he was rejected. Right. He was condemned for getting involved. He was put in, he was put to flight because of it. Because he had done wrong prior to that intervention. Now we have him intervening here in Midian once again but the outcome is different. Let us read on. Verse 18. And when they came, speaking of the daughters, they came to rule their father. He said, how is it that you are come so soon today? So he's wondering now, the dad is asking, how come you are back so early? Because evidently it was customary for when the, the, when the daughters went out to water the flock, that these shepherds would drive them away, they would water their flocks first, and then the girls would have to wait until they were done, then they would go afterwards. So it took them a longer time to water their father's flock. But this day, there was a difference. This day they, gave, they came back early and the father was wondering, asking them, how is it that you are come so soon today? Verse 19, and they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. An Egyptian delivered us. Very key. God is very specific in the words, in the language that he's using here. An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds. An Egyptian delivered us out of the hands of those who were taking advantage of us. An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of those who were, who were, who were treating us wrong, who were not allowing us to have what we had a right to. 
the well was public property. Everyone in that area had access to that well. However, this group of men thought because they were men, or maybe just because they were bullies, right? You have people like that who just think that they can just come and take advantage of people weaker than them, right? And so they stepped up and it was their custom to always do this to, to Ruth's daughters. However, this in this instance, an Egyptian by the name of Moses delivered us, they said, out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. So we have here Moses stepping into the situation, defending and protecting them, driving away those who were, who were resisting them, who were hampering and hindering them from getting access to what they needed. And not only that, but he went a step further. They said that he drew water enough for us and watered the flock. So right here, Moses now is stepping into a situation where he immediately stepped in and took care of Jethro's daughter's flocks. Verse, let's move on to the next verse. Verse 20, and he said unto his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Now, he just did some daughters, he just did something wonderful for you, right? He just, you just explained to me that he delivered you out of the hand of the shepherds. He drew water for, for you. He watered the flock. Where is he? Why is it that you have left him? How could you, we are, we are people who are used to showing hospitality. How is it that you have left him there at the well? Call him that he may eat bread. Okay, so one good turn, as we would say, one good turn, deserve, one good turn deserves another. He did something good for us. The least we can do is give him bread to eat. Let's move on to verse 21. The Bible says, and Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. Moses was content to dwell with the man. So he came in to eat bread and he ended up staying there, living there dwelling there with him. The Bible says he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter and verse 22, and she bare him a son. And he called his name Gershom for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. So now we have here Moses who fled Egypt for his life, running away from the mistake, from the sin, from the wrong that he did. And how many of us have done that, right? We do wrong. We, 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 we show our weakness. We show our frailty. We show our faults. And people see it. It, it is exposed and we feel embarrassed, right? Or some of us, it may even have been that we did something wrong, right? On the job, you did. You said something wrong. You did something wrong. And everybody knows about it now. And now you feel like you're, you're running away. You feel like you feel like there's there's something on your head now, right? There's something on your head. There's a mark on you now, and everybody's out to get you. And you don't you do not feel like there's any hope for you now. You feel like this is it. You're marked off, right? Your name your name is scratched out, erased from the book. The Bible says that Moses was content to dwell here with the man, and he gave him his daughter for wife, and he had a son with her named him Gershom because he says, I have been a stranger in a strange land. So we have here now this murderer, this runaway, <laughs> this runaway murderer has now found refuge in a foreign land and he has taken to him a foreign wife, but he was content. The Bible says that he was content to dwell there. And for many of us, we have fled situations and we, we now find ourselves in a strange place we're like, what am I doing here? But you're content to be there. Amen. So now we move over now to chapter three. And the interesting thing here is that in this particular, uh, in Exodus, in this particular book, the Bible does not tell us the time frame, the timeline. But if you turn with me over to the book of Acts, and I will come back. Do not lose your, your place here in, in Exodus three. We will come back to it. Turn with me to Acts chapter seven. And we will look at verse 22. Acts 
chapter 7, verse 22. The Bible says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. So we know here that Moses was, was raised up. We, have, we read, if we look carefully over in chapter 2 of Exodus, that Moses as a babe of three months old, his mom, and I, the last time we were together, we talked about this. At the age of three months, his mother, his mother had hit him because Pharaoh at that time was um, concerned because the children of Israel were multiplying, right? All the women were having babies like nothing they had ever seen. And this was intimidating to the Pharaoh of Egypt, to the king of Egypt, because he saw the children of Israel multiplying. And of course, because the Bible says he did not know Joseph, right? He did not know Joseph, who was a blessing to the Pharaoh before him. And the children of Israel were given refuge in Egypt, according to Joseph's time. But now this new Pharaoh did not know Joseph. He did not know that Joseph had a heart towards Pharaoh, had a good heart towards Egypt and Joseph's family as well. They were not there to fight them. Even though they were increasing in number, they were not there to fight them. Egypt had given them refuge in Goshen. They had their own land. They had their own cattle and they were safe and protected there in Egypt when famine had come to Canaan. They had fled to Egypt for refuge. However, now because this new Pharaoh did not know Israel did not know Joseph and did not understand the people of Israel. When he saw them multiplying, he thought to deal wisely with them. And he thought, okay, the best way that I can weaken this nation that is multiplying so greatly is to make sure that I kill every man child that is born. So he put this plan into place to kill all the children, all the male children. He told the two midwives, the two Hebrew women who were midwives, every time you go in to, to help with the birth of a Hebrew woman, of a Hebrew mother who's about to give birth. If you see at the birth that the child is a boy, kill the child right there. Do not let him survive beyond that moment of birth. The Bible says that the women feared God and they did not want to do it. They refused to do it. So the Bible says that Moses's mother, when she saw that at Moses's birth that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. So she was able to hide the fact that she had given birth to a man child and she kept him safe for three months. But after three months, she was no longer able to keep him safe. So she decided that it would be best for me just to put him out there and have someone else find him. And prayerfully, he would be safe and someone else can raise him. Well, God, in his sovereignty, when she put him in this little ark of bulrushes that she made for him, that she had put together and pitched it over with, with, with pitch, to hold it together and she put the babe Moses in it and she put him on the river. And she told the older sister Miriam to keep your eye on the basket, keep your eye on the little ark and see where he goes. And of course she did. And God had it that it was Pharaoh's daughter that found Moses. And when she saw him, she thought it was a gift from her God. And she took him in and the Bible says she raised Moses as her own son. So now Moses, for 40 years of his life, for the first 40 years of his life, he was raised in Egypt as a prince. So the Bible tells us here in Acts 7, 22, that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. So we do not have here, as my husband would say, a piker. This is someone who was learned. The Bible calls him wise. He had the wisdom of the Egyptians, all the wisdom of the Egyptians, Moses had it. And the Bible says he was mighty in words and in deeds. Let's read on to verse 23, Acts 7, 23. And when he was full 40 years old, so now we have the book of Acts giving us the timeline. When he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Verse 24, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? 
Let me pause there. The Bible says he showed himself unto them as they strove. Now, this was Moses's choice to reveal himself to his Hebrew brothers. The Bible says he would have set them at one again. So his desire at this moment was to unite them, to stop the fight, to be a peacemaker, right? To step into a volatile situation, to step into an argument, to step into a fight and bring restoration and peace, bring unity. The Bible says in verse 27, but he that did his neighbor wrong, thrust him away saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of, Lord, of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. I am going to pause there in the book of Acts. 40 years were expired. So Moses was 40 years in Egypt. And now 40 years he has been living in the land of Midian with his father-in-law, with his wife. And he had not just one son, but the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that he had two sons. So now God has, God has established, Moses is established now in his contented life here in, in Midian. And now we come to chapter three of Exodus. The Bible says, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So now this prince of Egypt, this man, this man who was raised as an Egyptian, the Bible says in Acts 7, he had all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was a mighty man. So now we know that Moses left this splendor, the glory of Egypt as a murderer, right? And for many of us, we had our moments of glory. We had our moments when we were shining. We had that ideal job, that ideal position. Things were going well in our lives. And we say, oh, my future is bright. Things can only go, go upward from this point on. And we had such great hope in our, in our hearts. We were expecting greater things to happen. And then something happens to set us back. We have what looks like a setback. We have what looks like our lives are decreasing. And this is where Moses is right now. 40 years working, not even having his own, because the Bible tells us in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 3 that he kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. So he did not even have his own. And, and it's, it can be difficult for us when we are, we are, we are supposed to be stewarding what belongs to other people. We are supposed to be caring for what belongs to others. And we're like, when Lord, when will I have my own? When, I, when am I going to have mine? When is it going to be my season? When is it going to be my time to be blessed? But the Bible tells us that Moses was content to dwell there. He was content for 40 years. And you know what? This could be because of what he had done. Sometimes when we do wrong, we do not feel that we qualify for better things. We, we think that our, we are, as I said before, that our names are, are erased, that we are struck off the list of those who will be blessed, that we, sh we, we are pulled off the line. What are you doing here? Right? What are you doing here? You know you don't qualify to be on, in the number. You've done wrong. And people will hold your wrong over your head. You yourself will hold your own wrong over your head. Right? So we don't, the Bible doesn't give us any insight into this. But the Bible says he was content to dwell there, to dwell in Midian with his father-in-law. He was content for 40 years to take care of other people's things, right? So sometimes life can, can bring things your way or even things, choices, decisions that we make can cause us to get to this place of giving up. Of saying, okay, you know what? Things will never get better than this, but I'm okay with that. And we settle, right? We settle. We get content right there. But right in that place of settling is where God comes to meet you. 
right in that place where you count yourself out. God does not count us out. God does not count you out. I'm here to tell you this morning that God did not strike your name off the list. God did not forget you. It, it may have seen like, a, it may seem like a very long time you've been there just doing the same. Oh, I spoke with you the last time we were together. I focused only on verse one. You're there doing the mundane, doing the same. Every day looks the same. Monday looks like Thursday and Tuesday looks like Saturday. And you fall into this routine and you get up in the morning and, and you can practically do it with your eyes closed because you're, you've gotten accustomed to doing the same old, same old. And you've gotten comfortable there. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God is coming right there to where you are. God is coming right there to visit you, right there where you're doing the routine, where you're taking care of things that are not, aren't even your own. Some of you are taking care of children that are not your own. But God called you to it and you're trying to stay consistent. You're trying to be faithful to it. You keep getting up and you keep going through. You keep doing it. It may, see, it may seem simple, right? We talked last time that being a shepherd was not a, glor was not a glorious occupation. It was not a glorious occupation, right? It was demanding. It was hard. It was difficult. It was physically challenging, physically demanding. You had to give your life over to, to the sheep because sheep cannot take care of themselves. They cannot fend for themselves. So here was Moses content to live this life that required him to do hard labor, right? To get up while it was still dark and to take care of someone else's sheep, his father-in-law's sheep. But the Bible says that as we learned in, in Acts chapter seven, that he did it for 40 years. Can you stay consistent for that long? When things aren't changing, when things aren't shifting, when things aren't getting better, right? You're staying there and it's, you're just doing the same over and over and over and over and over and over and over and, and there seems to be no change and you do not get discouraged. The Bible says Moses was content. Can you be content right there you, where you are? Can you settle in and continue to do it as unto the Lord? The Bible tells us that we are to do all things as unto the Lord with all our hearts. So here was Moses. He had no, no understanding of God. He hadn't met God at this point. Remember, he had been raised in Egypt, Egypt is a heathen land. Egypt, by the way, represents sin. He was only exposed to sin. That's all he knew. And he fled that. So it's no wonder that he was okay with committing murder. That is what sin will do to you. Sin will push you to the extreme. Sin will cause you to do wrong. And that is exactly what happened to Moses. If you dwell in the tents of wickedness, right? If you dwell among people who are doing wrong, who are not serving God, you will, you will fall into that behavior. However, the Bible says that he fled, right? He fled. Thank God he fled. So he fled to Midian. And now here he is content in his life, taking care of his father-in-law's father property, his father-in-law's flock. The Bible says in the second half of chapter three of Exodus chapter three, verse one, he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So we know if we connect Acts chapter seven with this verse, we know that if he had been doing it for so many years, this terrain was familiar to Moses, right? This was not new ground. He was familiar with this area. He lived out here. So he knew where to take the sheep. You know, the, the shepherd was responsible to go out and, and look over the land to make sure that he would be able to take the flock out to fertile ground. Sheep need to eat. And they are grazers. They graze all day long. They will nibble, nibble, nibble. I, I, teased, I teased some of us last time. I said some of us snack all day long. We are God's people, the sheep of his pasture. We nibble all day long. Right? We are like sheep. So now he's, he had to go out and look for green pasture to take the sheep. So he was familiar with this area. The Bible says he came to the back side of the desert, right? And whenever we think about the back side of anything, we do not think that it's an appealing area. 
It is not an area that many of us want to go to. It is not an area we like, as I said the last time, we like the, the, the front because the action is happening up front, right? The crowd is up front. But no, he took, him, he took them to the backside of the desert. The Bible says, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now my focus, verse two. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. <laughs> angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord. Back in Luke, uh, if you move with me to Luke chapter 1. Turn with me quickly to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Verse 11 reads, Luke chapter 1, verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Jump down to verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Verse 18. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. Verse 19, and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. So we have here the designation angel of the Lord. However, in this, in this instance here, we see that this particular angel identified himself by name. He says, I am Gabriel. So we know here that the angel of the Lord here is Gabriel. If you look over with me onto that same chapter, Luke chapter 1, verse 28, the Bible says, and the angel, no, let's go back to verse 26, sorry. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Okay, so here we have the same angel of the Lord appearing on to Mary. And, he, and the Bible tells us it is the angel Gabriel. So when we hear angel in the, in the Hebrew, it's the, it's the word malach. And in the Greek, it is angelos. So we have here the, the translation for the word angel is the word messenger, one who brings a message. So here we have this, this messenger from the Lord appearing to Zacharias and the same angel appearing to Mary. However, there are instances where that designation angel of the Lord, when it shows up in scripture, we're not talking about a messenger, one of God's created beings, that bring messages for him or who work for God. This is a pre-incarnate, right? A pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. How do we know this? Let's look into the scriptures. The Bible tells us in the book of Judges chapter six, if you turn with me to Judges chapter six, Verses 11 through 16. I'm just going to read through it quickly. And there came an angel of the Lord. I'm reading from Judges chapter 6, beginning at verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abiezerite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? 
And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Verse 14, pay close attention. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. So we have here the designation angel of the Lord. When we get now to verse 14, when the angel of the Lord is, is introduced to us in Judges 6, 11, we have here in verse 14 now, the Lord looking upon him. So we know here that the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself. Turn with me to Luke 1. Sorry, no, not, not Luke. Turn with me to 1 John 4, 12. 1 John 4, 12. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. The first clause, the first sentence, no man hath seen God at any time. Remember I said earlier that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. How do we know that it is Jesus Christ? The Bible tells us right here in 1 John 4, 12. No man hath seen God. And this is speaking about God the Father. Amen? Turn with me again to 1 Timothy 6, 16. 1 Timothy 6, chapter 6, and verse 16. Who only hath immortality? dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So the Bible tells us here that God dwells in light which no man can approach unto. So we know that God the Father, right? God the Father, Jehovah, that no man can approach unto him. So how come now this angel of the Lord is appearing to Moses? Turn with me to one, one more scripture here. John 1, 18. John, the gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 18. The Bible says, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. So no man had seen God at any time, but Jesus Christ, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, declares, declares God. So whenever God is manifested, whenever God is shown forth, it is Jesus Christ appearing. So we have here an, a, a pre-incarnate, what scholars call a pre-incarnate before Jesus put on flesh, human flesh, right? When he was born of, of Mary, before that time, when he came in the flesh, he would appear at random times, according to God's will. When God wanted to visit his people and he wanted to visit a specific person, he would always appear to that person in the form of an angel. And when you read that designation, the angel of the Lord, and how will you know that it is God himself? As you read on in that passage, you will either see that eventually the Bible will say the Lord himself, or he will say, I, he will, he will call himself, I, I am sending you. Okay. So you will know that it is God himself speaking. Amen. Yes. And the second instance that you will know that it is God, because when, when the person that he appears to falls down and worships, he will accept it. Only God is to be worshipped. Amen. So you will have instances in the Bible where you will see someone, an angel will appear to someone and they fall down to, to worship them and they will tell them, no, get up. I am a man like you. Right. That happens in the book of Revelation when the angel was, was showing John 
taking him on the tour of heaven. And he fell down and he said, no, get up. I am a man like you. I'm, I'm a created being just like you. But if the person accepts worship, you know that that is God himself. So here we have Moses not even owning his own. The only thing he has now is his wife and, his, and, and one son. And the Bible we learned later in Acts that he had two sons by her. Now we have Moses now not even having his own, not having his own home, not having his own possessions. He has been broken down to his barest minimum. He has been brought very low, very, very low. But we know that this is a great place to be as, when, when it comes to God, because we know that God is very near to those who are humble. The Bible says God loves the humble, right? He gives grace to the humble. God will visit us. God will come near to those who are, who are broken in heart, who, ha, who, have, who are at that place of humility, who, who are not puffed up. You see, when, when Moses was, when Moses was in, in Egypt, and the Bible says he, that he was, he was learned in all the wisdom of, e of the Egyptians, right? So he had all this Egyptian knowledge that he was raised up in. The best, right? Because he was a prince. The best that Egypt had to offer as regard in regards to his education. The best as regards to his, his robes, his, his dress, right? His jewelry, everything. Everything that he had was the best because he was from the Pharaoh's household, Yet he had to flee from there because of a, a mistake that he made, because of a sin, a sin, murder is sin, because of a sin that he committed. And murder is a sin against God, right? Thou shalt do no murder. Murder is a sin against God. And here we have Moses now. He had fled the glory, the splendor of Egypt. And now he's, he's, he doesn't even have his own. He's broken down now. He, he's serving. All he is now is a servant, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, to this broken down man, to this man who had run away from the life as he knew it, to this man who felt that maybe at this point he felt he didn't even deserve to have his own. He was content to just take care of other people's to take care of his father-in-law's property. And I'm, I know I'm speaking to some of you right now. Life has dealt you such a blow. You felt so, so taken advantage of, beaten down. You feel like you are at your wit's end. You feel like you cannot sink any lower than you are right now. I am telling you right now that God is near to you. God is near to you. Turn with me to Psalm 34, the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, chapter 34, and let's look at verses 18 and 19. Verses 18 and 19. The Bible says, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. God is near to you when you are hurting, when you feel broken, when you feel cast aside, when you feel rejected, when you feel that life has not been fair to you, when you feel that the, the people that you should have been depending, dependent on rejected you and cast you aside and say that you will never amount to anything. And they say that you will never rise above where you are right now. And maybe even in your heart, you are struggling to come to terms with that. You are telling yourself, I, things are not going to get better for me. I can't see my way out of this. I cannot see myself out of this, this pit that I've fallen into. I feel like I do not even have the strength to climb out. The Bible says in Psalms 33, 34, verse 18, the Lord is nigh. That word means near unto you in your brokenness, your heart feeling broken, feeling that you're, you're not worth it. You, don't, you do not qualify. You have, been, you have been counted off because of the wrong that you did, wrong choices that you made, decisions that you made that you thought in that moment, it, it's, it's okay, I can do this. And then you, you feel like you disappointed 
God, you feel like you disappointed yourself. God is near to you right now. The Bible says, and he saved it such as be of a contrite spirit. He's here to rescue you. He is coming to rescue you, to pull you out, to bring you out of that place of depression, to bring you out of that, that place of dejection. He's coming to bring you out, to deliver you, to save you. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Do you feel like you're inundated by trouble? As soon as you pull your foot, your last foot out of the last trouble, and you're stepping forward, you say, okay, now I'm going to move forward. And as you take that step forward, here comes trouble again. Here comes misfortune again. From one trouble to the next, it just seems that your life is just full of troubles. Every time you, you step out, you get up to try and you feel like you garner your strength and you pull yourself together and you, you know, you, 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 you wrap your, 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 your belt around you and you tighten, you gird up your loins and you get ready now to fight and to push forward. Here comes trouble again. The Bible says many are the, the afflictions of the righteous. Trouble is going to come. God never promised that, he, that when he saved you, he's going to set you up on a cloud with a little harp and you just get to play music and relax and just, you know, just have a fine day. No, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Remember, I spoke with you last time when, I, when we focused on Exodus chapter three, verse one. And I told you sheep keeping was difficult. Because the, why? Because you have to protect the sheep. There are many, many predators. There are many animals out there that love sheep. There are wolves. Right? They are lions, they are bears. They are, they are even other, other evil men. They are evil men who want sheep, who want to steal the sheep. So you have to always be watchful. You always have to be, have to be on your guard, right? It's a, it's, you always have to be on your guard. And some of us feel like that, that we always have to be on our guard because it just seems like when I relax, something bad happens. Right. So every time I, I, I think that I can now, OK, let, let me just get a nice drink and sit down. It seems that the minute you sit down, here comes another trouble. Here comes another problem. Right. And you're like, oh, my goodness, there's no rest. God says many are the afflictions of the righteous. But I love the, the next clause. I love the next clause it says, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. There's deliverance for you out of all the troubles. And who's bringing you out? The Lord. Who's bringing you out? Jehovah, the self-existent one. The one who spoke the world into being. The one who declares with his word and things come into creation. Things come into being. That one, that God, that same God, is coming down to deliver you out of all your troubles. So let's go back to my scripture, Exodus chapter three. So we have here Moses, Moses, the sheep keeper. At this point, we only know him as the one keeping his father-in-law's sheep. The Bible says in verse two, the angel of the Lord. So as we have, we have already established that this is a pre-incarnate appearing of, of Jesus. Before he came in the flesh, he came in angelic form. He came as the angel of the Lord, appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. So now as, when I was doing my, my, my background research about the desert, you know, like, because this is where Moses lived. Listen, there's nowhere you can go that God can't find you. Okay. There's nowhere you can go. Nowhere, nowhere. You cannot hide from God. He will find you. In fact, his, his eyes are always upon you. The Bible says darkness are, and light are the same to him. David said, if, even if I make my bed in hell, you're there. So the Bible also tells us that the heavens of heavens cannot contain God. His presence is everywhere at the same time. So right there where you are, right there where you, you, you are sitting, feeling down, feeling rejected, feeling unqualified, God is right there with you. The Bible says that right here where Moses was living his life, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. As I was doing my, my, my background research about the desert terrain and what it, because I wanted to get a picture in my mind of the terrain, what it would look like out there. We know that the desert is a very dry place. It's a very hot place. It's not a comfortable place to live. 
okay? Yet he was content to be there. And there are times, you know, we can choose, we can choose to, to relax in something like to punish ourselves. I said earlier that we feel like we do not qualify for better, right? We do not feel like we deserve better. And sometimes we just choose to settle, right? We just choose to settle there. So here we have Moses in this difficult area, in this place that was very hot. And we know that the terrain can be, um, of course, things can live there, right? Because there, there were sheep being kept there. There were sheep being kept there in the desert. So there had to be grass around. There had to be enough in the area to sustain the flock. And he was doing it for 40 years and he was doing it successfully. So the Bible tells us that right there in that difficult terrain, right there where he was doing for others, not for himself, he was not serving himself. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses out of the midst of a bush. So we know that bush, bush, bushes had to be everywhere. Everywhere that Moses would turn, bushes had to be there. But the Bible says that the Lord appeared. Now, this is a very interesting word, appeared. This is the word in the Hebrew Ra, it's pronounced Ra, R-A-A-H. And it has to do with showing himself. So the Lord showed himself unto Moses in a flame of fire. It's not like God unveiling himself. Not only that, that God is now showing forth himself, he's revealing himself, but God is also looking. It has the word in the meaning of the word, it's not just God appearing so that you can glance, so that Moses could glance over there and see, oh, God is there. But it had to be that God appeared with a steadfast look at Moses. All right. So this word Ra is very interesting because it, it's not only about showing himself, but showing himself to look, right? Showing himself to fasten his eyes upon Moses. So here now we have the angel of God, we have the Lord appearing now where he knew Moses was. Remember Moses went on the, verse one tells us on the back side of the desert, came to the Mount of God, to Horeb. And the Lord now appear in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. God just chose a specific bush and here God's presence appeared. God himself appeared and he's watching Moses. The Bible says, and he looked that same word, Ra'a. So now Moses, has, Moses is looking, and when he looked, the first thing he saw was that the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Now, many, many scholars will tell you that this was not a phenomenon in and of itself because of the extreme heat in the desert. There are times that certain bush would just burst into flames. But the interesting thing here is that the bush was not consumed. So now God used this. Now God knew that in order for Moses, for him to get Moses' attention, he had to do something unusual. Remember I said Moses had been doing, had been walking this terrain for 40 years. He was familiar with the area. A bush on fire was not a phenomenon. It happened often in the desert. However, what was unusual about this particular bush that was burning with fire was that the bush was not being consumed. So God got his attention. Amen. The Bible says he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Verse three. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. Say, gotcha. Say that to yourselves. Gotcha. So now Moses now, because he's seeing this wonderful thing, right? He calls it a great sight. Moses says, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. So that whenever you see this word in this, in this account here and you're seeing the word see, I will look, it's that same word raw. It's not a glance. It's not talking about a glance. Once the bush, once the bush, Moses' eye looked upon the bush, it drew Moses now. And God is using this. God is, remember, God is in the midst of the flame, in the midst of the bush, and God's eyes are upon Moses. And now Mo, it has gotten Moses' attention, and now Moses is turning aside. Moses says, I will turn aside. That's a very interesting phrase, turn aside. Remember, Moses has been faithful to keep his father's flock. He had been doing it for 40 years. So he could be relied on to keep his course to go in, to go out, sorry, and come in. He was faithful to stay the course. 
But today, now, as the word, as the Bible tells us in verse one, now, this particular day, Moses is going to deviate from the norm. Moses is going to turn aside from his customary path. Are you willing now to pull out of the regular, to pull away from doing the same old, same old when God gets your attention? Or have you fallen into the routine for so long that you do not feel that you can try anything new? God is coming now. His eyes are upon you now. He's near to you now. And he's waiting for you to turn aside, to look on him because he wants to speak to you. Can God get your attention now? Can he speak to you now, right there where you're doing what you are doing right now in this season, what you're doing day by day, the same routine? Can God visit you there? Because he's coming now to do so. He's coming now to speak to you out of that, in that environment, in that environment that you're very familiar with, through something that, that you're very used to seeing, right? God is using a bush. There are bushes everywhere where Moses was, but God is getting ready to speak to him out of there. God can speak to you from anything. God can use anything, anything in your environment to speak to you, to get your attention and cause you to have a conversation with him. Amen. So here we have Moses now turning aside, deviating from the from from the customary, turning out of the of what he is. It is normal for him to do. I am going now to turn aside. He it is an act of his will. He is choosing to do this now. He's not going to ignore this opportunity, but he wants to draw near. At this point, he doesn't know that it is the Lord and he does not know that the Lord is looking. His gaze is fastened upon him. But Moses is saying to himself, I am choosing now to turn aside, to see this great sight, to see this phenomena. Why this bush is not burnt? Verse four, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, that same word, ra'a, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God, so now that Moses is coming to the bush, he's looking at the bush, has no idea. He's looking straight at God. And God is watching Moses coming, looking straight at him. When the Lord, verse four says, saw that he turned aside to see, then God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Moses, Moses, very important. My husband spoke about it on, on Friday Bible study. Moses, Moses, when you hear it twice, right? Verily, verily, it is established. When Jesus says verily, verily, it's established. That thing is settled, right? Abraham, Abraham, right? When you, when, um, um, when you hear God, God speak twice, when you hear it twice, it is established. Now God, and there's also that sense of urgency, right? When I, sometimes I have, my husband might be talking on the phone or he might be in a different part of the, the home and I, I need to get his attention urgently. I will say, honey, honey, right? When I say that like that back to back fast, he knows that I need his attention immediately. So it's also an attention getter. So here we have God calling out to him from the midst of the bush and God said, Moses, Moses. Isn't that interesting? Here he is all the way in the backside of the desert. 40 years away from the familiar, 40 years away from what he's come accustomed to, a fugitive, a fugitive from the Egyptian justice, from the Egyptian law, a murderer on the run, dwelling in contentment in Midian, having his family but not owning his own as yet, and God knows exactly who he is. The Bible calls him by name, Moses, Moses, so the Lord is calling your name today. Others, you, sometimes you can go into a crowd, you can go places and you feel, like a, you feel like a square peg in a round hole, like you just don't fit. You just don't fit. You feel like you do not belong there. In fact, the way sometimes, the way that people treat you make you feel like you don't belong there. But God is calling you by name today. Moses, Moses, he's calling you. He's calling you by name, Anne, Anne. Carol, Carol, Kevin, Kevin, Kelvin, Kelvin, Amanda, Amanda, Annette, Annette. He's here today. He's calling your name. He's getting your attention now. He's getting ready to speak to you. 
And it's interesting now that he's getting ready to visit Moses, this fugitive from, from the Egyptian law, this man who has run away from the familiar, this man who, who was an outcast because if he had stayed where he was, he would have been killed. But he ran for his life and his life was preserved in Midian for 40 years. He did not have his own, but he was content. He did not have his own, own, own property, but he was happy to live there. And he was, being, he was being multiplied because he had a wife and he had children. And now God has come down himself. God has appeared, has, has shown forth himself to Moses out of a, flame, a bush on, on fire. And God called him by name, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Let's read on to verse five. And he said, this is God speaking now. This is the Lord speaking. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest this holy ground. God says, hold on. Do not come any closer. Do not come any closer. Remember we read before, right? We read in in 1 John 4.12 and we read in Timothy, right? That no one can, God, God lives in light that no man can draw near to, right? So God is telling Moses, do not come any closer. Remember, Moses was curious. Moses wanted to see this, this great sight. God says, draw not nigh hither. So now we know that God is speaking audibly. God is speaking audibly to Moses in this instance. He is having a conversation with God. God says, do not come any closer. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. Now this is interesting. Very, very interesting. We know from biblical accounts that servants did not wear shoes, right? So there are two things that God is saying here. God is, God is requiring Moses to position himself as his servant. Remove your shoes. Servants went barefooted. Often in that part of the, in that part, biblical times, in that part of the, the world, servants went barefooted. So God is saying to Moses, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. There's also another reason why. Also in, that, in, in those communities, in that part of the world, when you came into a person's home, and many people still practice this around the world, when you come into a person's home, they ask you to please take off your shoes. Why? Because you've been walking outside. It's dirty. There's a lot going on out there. We do not want it coming into our home. Please take your shoes off at the door. So this, this is God saying to Moses, position yourself as my servant and you are entering my abode. Wherever God is, that's his dwelling place. He has sanctified that area. He has sanctified that place. He has set it aside as holy, as sacred. Why? Because his presence is there. This is not, even though this is the terrain that Moses is quite accustomed to, he, he, for 40 years he was walking this area. Now he has entered the place and because God is there, now you cannot behave the way that you used to behave. You cannot just tramp around here in, in your sandals, Moses, right? You have to have a reverence for me. You have to have a reverence for my presence here. This is now holy ground. He told him, the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. It is sacred place. It is sanctified space. You are entered into a sanctified area, Moses. I know this looks like the mountain to you. This looks like the area where you are accustomed to taking your father-in-law's sheep, but this is holy ground. You have to exhibit reverence for my presence here. Amen. Reverence for God's presence. And for many of us, we have this is this is a, this is a little tap on the shoulder for many of us, because for many of us, we become very casual about God. Right. We become very casual and we talk to God like we, you know, like, you know, like what, what you doing, Jesus? Like, you know, we just talk to God real casually with no reverence. But God is admonished. God is cautioning Moses. Take off your shoes. Where you're standing is where I am. And where I am is holy ground. Now, let me say this to you as children of God. We know that God by his spirit dwells in you, dwells in me. He dwells in us. Therefore, we are sanctified. 
we have to consider ourselves holy ground. And because we are holy, we should not mingle with what is unclean. We should not mingle with what is unholy. God says, come ye out from among them and be ye holy. Be ye holy that bear the vessels of the Lord. God is calling us out to live a sanctified life, a life that is separated. Okay, so here we have God coming down, having a face-to-face -face encounter with Moses. This, this fugitive, this murderer, right? This man who has settled, who has settled for being a servant to his father-in-law. To, be a, to being a servant for his father. This is a man, remember the Bible tells us, tells us in Acts 7 that he was learned in all the wisdom of, of the Egyptians. Yet, here we have him serving his father-in-law in humility, being content to do it, right? Some of us feel like because we have, you know, so many degrees after our names, right? We have you know, this, this degree and that degree that we are qualified to only do certain types of job. And, and you would not even think, right? We would not even think to do any certain kinds of job because that's way beneath me, right? That's, that's beneath my standards. That's, oh, that don't ask me to do that. Don't you know who I am? Right, I'm master of this and doctor, doctor this. And, and we think that, that qualifies us only to live on a certain level. But here we have Moses, a prince of Egypt, learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, taking care of sheep. Did not, did not think that it was, it, it was way beneath him. In fact, he was probably at the point where he, he didn't think that there was better for, for him. Right? He was a fugitive, a fugitive, a fugitive. So now we have the Bible telling us in, in Exodus 3, verse 5, God tells him, take, take your shoes off. You're, you're standing in a different place now. You're standing in my presence. And now in verse 6, God is introducing himself to him. He says, moreover, furthermore, let me tell you something about, let me tell you something more, Moses. And God introduces himself. I am, I am, I am the God of thy father. So right here in this very, very first sentence in verse 6, God is establishing his connection to Moses, his relationship with Moses, his covenant with Moses. And that is the first assurance that God will give you. God will assure you that you are in relationship with him. God will give you that assurance that you are in relationship with him. He says, I am the God of thy father. Okay, so right here, this broken man, this man who has been humbled by life, by situation, by a, by a choice, by a wrong choice that he made, God came and met him right there. And God is affirming his connection now. I haven't forgotten who you are. God says, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the father of the patriarchs the one that God established his covenant with. He says, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. The Bible says, and Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Why? Because when you stand in the presence of a holy God, you recognize your sinfulness. You recognize that you are not worthy to show your face to him. Right? You, you recognize that you're not worthy to leave and lift your face up and, and look upon God. Moses hid his face. More than likely, he took his, his robe and covered his face. He was afraid to look upon God. So his first, his first reaction now was fear. God already assured him, assured him, established who he was, the God of your father, the God of your father. You have a direct connection with me. You have a covenant with me, Moses but he was afraid to look upon God. Let's look at verse seven. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So now God is getting, God is telling him, 
I have seen the affliction of my people. So God is coming down now, not to judge Moses about what he did, why he ran away from Egypt. God is telling him now, I, I, have, I am aware of some things that have been going on. I have surely seen, you see that, that term surely seen? That's a very interesting term. When you look it up in the original, it's like, I have seen, seen. Remember I talked about, I talked about that double when, when God says it and says it again, it's established. God says, what I have seen, I have, it has been established in my sight. Okay, I have seen, seen, he's saying, the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry. By reason of their taskmasters, I know what is being done to you, and I know who's doing it. Okay, I have heard. Now, many of us like to suffer in silence. It's good to cry out. It's good to cry out. It's good to cry out. It is a good thing to cry. It is a good thing to, thing to cry because God hears our cry. God says, I have seen, surely seen, the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by the reason of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrows. So affliction, their cry, and their sorrows. Your affliction, your cry, and your sorrow, your makob. I know what is causing you to grieve. God says, I know what is causing you to grieve. I have surely seen it. Seeing it, I have seen. I paid attention. I took note of it. I didn't ignore it. Okay? I did not ignore it. That is that raw, that word I told you that I fastened my eyes upon it and I did not look away. So God says, I, am I have looked upon it. I am still looking upon it. So I'm, I'm saying to you here sitting before me right now that God is looking upon you and his eyes are still, his gaze, his look, his eyes are still fastened upon you. He is seeing everything that is happening to you. He is seeing the things that are causing you to be discouraged. He's seeing what people have said to you. He has seen what people have done to you. He did not remove his eyes for a moment. He says, for I know their sorrows. I know their sorrows. God is well acquainted with what is causing you to cry. God is well acquainted in, in what is causing your heartache in what has broken your heart. But remember what we learned from, 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 uh, from Psalm 34. He is near to the broken in heart. He's very near to you. That's why he's coming down now. Because when people are hurt, when God's people are hurting, God moves towards them. God moves towards them. Turn with me to Psalm 147, verse 1. And I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. Psalm 147. Verses 1 to 3. Psalm 147, verses 1 to 3. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praises comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. Verse 3. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. That's the word of the Lord to you, those of you who are broken in heart, those of you who are weeping because of the situations in your life that you are enduring and you think there is no end to it. You think there's no healing for this. There's no healing for this pain. There's no change to this, to this disappointment. There's no change for me. It seems like I've been living in this, in this place of pain for so long and I do not think that there's any hope and I feel like giving up. The Bible tells us right here in Psalm 147, verse 3, he healeth. It's not a one-time thing. He healeth. He comes in to heal, and he continues to heal. It's an ongoing healing that he does. Some things, some things we can get over quickly. Some things that some hurt that we are suffering, some pain that we are feeling are so deep inside of us that it takes a greater work of God, of God's healing to bring that balm that we need. The Bible says he healeth 
the broken in heart. So if your heart is broken today, if your heart is broken today, if you feel discouraged, if you're at the point of giving up, if you're at the point of throwing in the towel and you just want to give up, there is no going forward for me. Things are not going to get better. I've reached out for help. I've called upon others and it seems like they didn't hear my cry. It seems like the system is set up against me. It seems like I, I do not qualify. You know, I feel like one of those who will fall between the cracks. I feel like one of those rejects. My heart is broken. The Bible tells us right here, God is speaking to you that he heals the broken in heart and he binds up their wounds. He bind death. He healeth and bind death. He healeth and bind death. We know there are times that, that you get a, a scar, a, 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 some kind of paint, a, a scar on your skin and you, it's not safe to keep it open. You have to cover it up, right? You have to put some kind of gauze. You have to put some kind of Band-Aid or bandage on it to give it time to heal properly. The Bible says that God bindeth up your wounds, right? He's coming to cover it up. Many of us do not want, we do not want our, our hurts to be seen, right? We need it to be covered up. We want those things to be covered up. We do not want people to see how badly we are hurting because they are going to judge us. They are, some, of the, some people may condemn us and say, it's our fault. It's your fault why that happened to you. If you hadn't, if you hadn't said that, if you hadn't done that, if you hadn't gone there, you knew better, right? And then that voice of condemnation that comes from the enemy is there in your ear constantly. But hear ye the word of the Lord. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Amen? God binds up your wounds. God is here to, to bring that balm, to bring that healing to you that you, you, you felt so long, so long, so long you've been living with this pain. It is so much a part of you. You've, you've learned to, got, to get comfortable with it, like Moses in that, in that desert place, content to be there because of maybe because of the wrong that he did. But God has come down today. God has appeared today. God has shown forth himself today through this word to let you know that he is near to you. He is here to heal you. He's here to bind up your wounds. He's here to make sure that after today, you will never feel the way that you did up to this point. You will never feel rejected anymore because his eyes are upon you. Remember I told you that when he appeared in that, in that bush, in that burning bush, he didn't just show forth himself, but his eyes were looking steadfastly on Moses. So God's eyes are locked upon you right now. God sees you where you are. God sees you where you are. God sees you exactly where you are. So do not be discouraged. Take hope, dear heart, today. God heals and he continues to heal. God binds up your wounds. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 1.15. 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Why did Jesus come into the world? To save sinners. Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to save you. You who feel disqualified. You who feel that your life is filled with bad choices, mistakes, sin. Christ Jesus came into the world to save you. That is the reason why Jesus came. Why did God come down in, on, that, on that mountain into that burning bush? To deliver his children. To deliver his children. Last scripture, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. 
verses six to eight. And I'm wrapping up there. I'm showing you the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're not only learning about Moses, we're learning also about ourselves. What is God doing for us today? What has God done for us? Romans chapter five, verses six through eight. For when we were yet without strength, like Moses, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, when you were not looking for him, when you, when you were missing the mark, when you were sinning, right? When you, weren't, when, you, when you were not even acknowledging God, when you were without strength, you didn't have it in you to get your, to pick yourself up. You did not have it in you to come out of sin on your own. At that specific time, Christ died for the ungodly, the Bible tells us. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die, right? If you can find good people, you say, oh, okay, I'll die for him. I'll sacrifice myself for him, right? If they're good. Verse 8, but... Here's the contrast. But God commendeth his love toward us. How did God demonstrate his love towards us? How did God push his love towards us? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How did God demonstrate his love towards us? God didn't just say, I love you. Right? When God came down to Moses, he says, I heard. I know, I surely know what's happening to my people. And he says, I am coming down now to deliver. I am doing something about it. I don't just know, but I'm going to do something about it. So what did God do for us? He did not leave us in our sin. The Bible says Jesus died, right? Christ died for the ungodly, verse 6 tells us. But here in verse 8, it tells us God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, when we were still missing the mark, when we were going astray like sheep, Christ died for us. When you were in your sin, when you were not even paying attention for him, when you weren't even calling out upon him, when you were not even calling out for rescue. Amen? Christ died for us. We know that when we look back in, and I'm just going to make reference for it, but back in Genesis 15, God had spoken to Abraham and God gave, God told him, God told him that you're going, I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to give you a son and that I'm going to multiply your seed like the stars of heaven. I'm going to multiply them like the sand of the earth. God told him, God promised him. And God told him that they're going to go into a land that is not theirs. And those who are there are going to take them captive and they're going to be held there. God told him. For 400 years, God told him, four generations. So a generation is 100 years. God says, and after those 400 years, I am going to deliver them and I'm going to bring them back into this land. So God had already purposed when they were still in their affliction, when they were still in Egypt. And remember I said earlier, Egypt represents sin. God was getting ready to pull them out of Egypt, pull them out of sin. And the same thing we have here in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that salvation, that rescue, that deliverance from sin, that rescuing, that bringing out from sin happened for us while we were still stuck in it, right? While we were still stuck in it. Who knows that when God comes down and say, I'm going to do something, it is done. It is done. It is done. So God has said, to, God is visiting us today. God has sat here with us today to tell us that what you're going through right now, that's a light thing for me. I am, I am healing you from that now. I'm delivering you from that now. I'm binding up your wounds right now. Because the big picture, the bigger thing that I, that I was focusing on, which is your sin, I already took care of that. Jesus already went to the cross. So everything else we know, we have confidence that everything else that has to do with us, God is going to do it. As we see in the life of Moses, God himself, God himself, he's not sending a messenger. 
He's not sending one of the prophets. He himself, he's saying, I'm coming down now. He himself appeared, the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ himself in pre-incarnate form, appearing himself, the Lord himself appeared to say, I am here now. My eyes are on you, Moses, and I am here to deliver my people. The reason why I'm visiting with you today is to tell you that there is something going on that I promised Abraham over 400 years ago that I was going to do this. And this is the set time for my deliverance. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this is the set time for your deliverance. This is the set time for God to visit you. This is the set appointed time for God to come to where you are. God is there, right there where you are, in your home, in your apartment, at that place of discouragement, at that place of depression. God is coming now to bring you up out of it. He's there to heal you, to bind up your wounds, and to give you hope and to give you a future to bring you out. Amen. So the Lord has come down today to deliver his people. God is visiting you today. And deliverance is your portion. Deliverance is your portion, saith the Lord. Amen. If you look at Exodus 3, verse 8. Verse 8, Exodus 3, verse 8. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land. Up, out, up and out. You're in a downcast state right now. You feel cast down. Sin will do that to you. Sin will oppress you. Right, sin will oppress you. And here, for the for the children of Israel, when you read this entire account of what was happening in the lives of God people, God's people, they were under severe bondage, and sin will do that to you. That's how sin does it. It, it just oppresses a person. But there is deliverance. There is deliverance. The Bible says, God says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of what is holding you back, out of what is holding you captive. And to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large land, right? Unto a good land, a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I'm going to pause there. He's not only bringing you up and out, but he's taking you into something better. So for those of you who were discouraged. Amen. Be an expectation for God to do great things, to bring sweet things into your life. Land flowing with milk and honey. And to be an anticipation, be an expectation that the bitter time, the bitter season is at an end. God is giving you his word today. I am come down. He said it in verse eight. I am come down. I have come to that low place where you are to bring you up, out. Say it to yourselves. God has come down to bring me up, out. This is your day to come up and out. Amen. To experience the sweetness, the sweet things that God has for you. Greater things are coming your way. This is the day of change. This day, mark my words, today, things are changing in your life. Even as God is releasing this word over our lives, things are changing in your lives today. So as of tomorrow, expect, expect for the manifestation of better things, sweeter things. This is the time of your deliverance. Amen? Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. I Amen. would like to share a couple of verses. I would like to admonish everyone to um, give their tithes and offerings. Um, we know we hear it time and time again from Pastor Arlette and Pastor Hamilton that we need your tithes and your offerings to help with support with the church uh, fund to uh, pay the bills, to pay the insurance, pay the pay the light, pay the 
uh, the rent for the church. Um, I would like to go over uh, two or three scriptures real quick and just to point um, what the word of God says. It's, um, if you look at Matthew 23, 23, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. And then we also have, if you look at uh, Luke 11, verse 42, it says, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manners of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done. This is Jesus talking and not leave the other undone. Now, if you look at the last verse I want to show you, um, Malachi 3.8, and as surely as you have received this word from Pastor Arlette Hamilton this morning, and I believe it's prophetic, um, I received that prophetic word today that tomorrow you will come out and something you're going to receive your manifestation. Amen. But one thing the word of God says in Malachi 3.8, it says, Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me, but ye say where we have robbed thee in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. If you go to verse 10, it says, Bring ye all ye tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, mm -hmm. says the Lord of hosts, if I would not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And if you go back to previous verses before, um, you will see that God was saying to the people to come back to him, but also to give him what belongs to, to God. And he says um, in uh, previous verses, he says uh, that he changes not in verse six. I am a mm -hmm. God the Lord that I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, are you not consumed? Even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinance, from practicing the things that you were supposed to be doing, yeah. and you have not kept them. But God is saying, return unto me, and I will return unto you. And he says, um, <clears throat> the good thing about that is, um, he was saying that he would, he would keep the adulterers, and he would keep the devourers away from your doorsteps, right? Yeah. How many of us are... Um, living day by day and wondering why I can't pay my, my bills. Why can't I, I don't, why don't I have enough to pay uh, for this or that? Um, why am I struggling? But I'm telling you that the word of God is the answer. God provides you a way out, a blessing. Amen. He says he, he presents you a blessing and a curse. And if you present your tithes and your offerings and believe that the tithe belongs to God, and you give God what belongs to God. And I know that many of you maybe are visiting this church, or maybe are visiting online, but I'm encouraging all the members of the church to give your tithes and those who are visiting to give your offering. And on top of that, name your seed. As you give your offering, say, Lord, I'm giving you this because I'm in expectation. Because prophet, or let, she, she said, she gave us a prophetic word that tomorrow I'm going to receive my, my manifestation, right? So I'm going to name my seed. Lord, I'm giving you this because uh, I'm giving you my tithes and I'm giving you my offering so that you can multiply what I have in my hands. Jesus did the same thing. He prayed before he gave to, to the multitude. He blessed what he had in his hands and God multiplied that and was able to feed others. So if you want to be the same, if you want to be blessed, if you want to have abundant in your life, you have to give, let go what you have in your hand and, and, and put it in God's hands. And God would manifest that and multiply that so that you'll be Amen. able to be blessed and bless others with it. So I encourage you today, please give your tithes and offerings. We need your support. We love you. God bless you. And have a blessed week. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kevin. Huh? Thank you very much. Also, if you look at um, our screen, if you look at it says victorythroughpraise.org forward slash donate, you'll be able to give uh, your tithe, your offerings, or whatever you want to give to the church. Remember that uh, our pastors are not receiving wages. They are doing this freely out of their hearts. They work. They work secular jobs. Please, I encourage you, please give your tithes and your offerings. You look at Cash App.
You just got to type in victory through praise, as like you see here, and just send whatever you can. And then the memo say offering or tithe. And at the end of the year, as many of you know, we all receive a, a, ten, uh, a little um, donation uh, letter that's saying how much we gave throughout the year so that you can claim your taxes and that'll be deducted from what you give. So I encourage everyone to please give through your cash app, give through the online website, and um, trust me, you will be blessed. God would de devour the devourer. He will keep the plagues away from your storehouse. He will keep it away from your doorsteps. Believe me, I've tried it. I've done it. I, I, I have, I would call it a testimony of yes. how God has kept me and my family and um, my home. And I, I know that it works. It works. When you give your tithes and your offering, it works. Try Amen. God. Try him. Test him. He said in, in Malachi 3.10, it says, test him. Test him in this, that he would open up the windows of heaven. Right? And he says he will pour enough so much that you won't have enough to receive it. Enough blessing that you will not receive it. So trust me, do it. And if you have not done it before, start doing it. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Kevin. Amen. And that's a that's a strong word of encouragement. And we are called, we are called to do that. We are called to do that um, for for others. Amen. To encourage each other in the good things of the Lord, because we want to see each other blessed. Amen. Amen. And as, as we looked in this this message today in the Word of God, we see that there that God promises what He promised He will do. And as and as Pastor Kevin told us, right? God says, "Prove me in this." See if I will do it. God is saying like, like a deer, do it and see what I do in response to your obedience. Amen. And, and just like the, and we tie that in with our message today, that God is faithful to his word. And when he said that he will do something in your life, you can stand on it. You can stand on it. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word abideth forever. So we can stand on the word of God and we can believe God when, when men will fail us. When we ourselves will fail ourselves, right? like Moses, he failed himself. He had better, he, had, he knew better than that, right? He was a prince, a prince becoming a murderer. But yes, we will fail ourselves. We will disappoint ourselves, but God will never disappoint us. Amen. God is faithful to his word and he has already set. He has been purposeful about what he will be doing in our lives. Amen. And there's just a set time for it to come to pass. Amen. Like I said, he said to Abraham, it's going to be for so long and then I will come down and I will bring, I myself will bring them out. And that was the day that he was, he, today he was coming down to Moses now to say, this is the time that I spoke to Abraham about. I am bringing my, my people out. So God is bringing his people out and he's bringing you out. And we want you to come all the way out into freedom. We want you to walk in freedom. Amen. Because remember the, the enemy is very busy and he will look, he will look to to try and, and, and trap you into a mindset that will not be profitable for you as a child of God. So when we look into the word of God and God says, do this, we have to trust his word because he's faithful. He has never failed us. Has God ever tell, told any of you to do anything and you did it and, and it went wrong? It, you, didn't, you didn't end up being blessed because of it? Yes. Right? We, we've never had opportunities like that where we have been obedient to God and God hasn't come through for us. Right, trouble is going to come. He's not. We're not going into a life of, of everything being perfect, but we know that God is going to be there for us, and He will bring us out. Amen. So we hold on to God's word today. We hold on to His promise of deliverance, of the of His of His promise of bringing us into into a better place. Amen. So I just release that word over you today. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your people, for your children gathered here today, Lord God. Father, I just release this word that you have spoken to us today over their lives Lord God I just lift my hand over them and I bless them Lord God that this is the day of, of turnaround for them that this is the day of your deliverance this is the day father that you are, you have come down you are appearing you are showing forth yourself and your eyes are upon them father and you are set this you have set this time aside father to deliver them to heal them to bind up their wounds father God to bring them out to bring them up and out as your word says father to bring them up 
out. Father, we thank you. We hold on to that word today. And I just release that word of deliverance in their lives, Father, in the name of Jesus. And I call forth for the manifestation in the natural, in the name of Jesus. Father, do the miraculous, do the impossible, do a God thing in their lives, Lord God. Show up and show off, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God. And God, I thank you for being our God, for being our Father, and for being for us in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for this day of deliverance, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much for visiting with us. Those of you who are new to the, to the online broadcast, we thank you so much for being with us. For those who are revisiting, thank you for returning. It is wonderful to see you. God bless you, all of you. Have a blessed week ahead.